Well, perhaps you all know the situation. Uh, somebody begins talking about Christianity. They begin talking about morals at work, right? These conversations, uh, casual conversations with friends, and things come up. What should I do in this situation? Why? And hey, have you heard about what's going on in the news? You know, and what do you think about that? Um, you've been in those situations, and you know, maybe you bring up your Christian faith. And you talk about a God who's made all things and, and who has the right to rule. And before you know it, you're being ridiculed for believing in a creator God. And that's very foolish and, and all sorts of stuff. And you get the little sneers and you get the snickers. And like, you believe that, you know, in this scientific age, you know, and uh, you decide to say something back. And then all of a sudden, you're met, you know, with the barrage of philosophical arguments. You get the big terms and the big words, and you're kind of just like, huh, I don't know, uh, you know, what should I do? You know, or nowadays, you know, you post up an, an, an article on Facebook, maybe from a Christian perspective, and your atheist friends, because everybody has to have atheist friends, right? Every Christian is an atheist friend. Uh, but, you know, you might get the response back from them. You know, like, you don't really believe that mumbo-jumbo, do you? You know, I mean, uh, you don't believe that fairy tale, do you? You know, you get that sort of thing. I mean, everybody gets it, you know? Um, being caught off guard. A lot of times that happens to the best of us. Being caught off guard, not knowing what to say. A lot of times we don't feel confident enough in our Christianity to defend, and so basically we capitulate the argument or we, the, the opportunity that we have to glorify God in response and we just kind of let that go. And basically we'll let our opponents win in some sort of way. We, we just we give up the fight. Many of us do not know the Christian faith. And, and when we say the Christian faith, as we're going to see later, uh, this is not how you feel about Christ or how you feel about God, but the body of teachings that constitute what the Christian faith is, that is what Christianity is, okay? Or perhaps you don't feel adequate enough to offer a defense because uh, the type of opponent that you have, maybe they're an intellectual type, okay? The ones that can be intimidating and usually are for a lot of Christians, uh, let's say on college campuses, usually the philosophy majors, right? So those philosophy guys are always using these big terms and they're taking you through these long, intricate arguments and <laughs> and stuff like that, and you're just kind of like, huh, um, let me get back to you. You know, we kind of just walk away from it. You know, uh, they can be intimidating. There's a lot of opponents out there that can be intimidating. You know, uh, not every Christian, you know, would feel comfortable, let's say, going up against a Richard Dawkins, or when he was still alive, a, a Christopher Hitchens, you know, or some of these other, you know, big-name atheists, and there are big-name atheists out there. Not every Christian feels comfortable going up against them, or even just answering back to them. More than ever, Christians need to know how to present and how to defend the Christian faith. The culture that we're finding ourselves living in right now, especially we are in what is being called a post-Christian culture. That is basically culture after Christianity. The idea is Christianity has already had its flair, right? It's already done its thing, you know, it had its influence, and basically society is basically saying, we want something else now. We're over that. We're beyond that. We're going into a post-Christian society. This means that more and more people are growing up without basic knowledge of the Bible. There was an article that I read recently in the LA Times because one of my atheist friends put it up on my Facebook page, right? See, there we go. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was an interesting article. And it was talking about how kids are growing up more secular how they're growing up without knowledge of the Bible at all, without knowledge of religion. We, we have uh, uh, what is today the generation of the nuns, is what they're called. They, they take no affiliation. They don't take any side with anything. They're called the nuns. They just, they just grow up. They're just there. Their basic idea is kind of like, well, we have some kind of moral. Uh, we have some kind of golden rule, but nothing based in a God, nothing based in any sort of religion. It's just about you be good to me, and I be good to you, and we all get along. And that's what people are being raised up with. The article stated that about 30% of Americans now classify themselves as not religious. That is a third of this country classifies themselves as not religious. You compare that to back in like 1950, 
you had 2% of Americans who were classifying themselves as not religious, according to that article. So we need to be aware of the culture that we're in. We can't assume anymore that people just know the Ten Commandments. You can't just go out and evangelize and, you know, hey, God says you're a sinner, you know, or if you had to die, if you died today, you know, what would you say to God if he asked you how to get into his heaven? Those don't work anymore because a lot of those old evangelism techniques, those, those old, in a sense, apologetic methods, at least the people you were speaking to grew up hearing the Bible in home, you know, but we can't assume that anymore now so society is really changing we're finding ourselves in a more secular a more pagan and a pluralistic society that is becoming more and more hostile to christianity so uh we really need to know how to defend the faith because if you're living in a country where, where a third of the people are claiming to be not religious that means a third of the people are already going to have a lot of questions, or they're going to they're going to mock you, or they're just going to you know write you off, something. Okay. So this first study, okay, we're going to give a brief introduction uh, to what the nature of apologetics is. Okay, it's basically going to be kind of like a defining class. We're just going to define what apologetics is. So basically, our our outline structure is this. Okay, we're going to start by first defining what apologetics is not okay what apologetics is not then we'll get into what apologetics is okay and finally and hopefully this is the gist of where i'm going to try to convince you tonight right finally we're gonna uh, i'm gonna give you guys some reasons okay why every christian okay should do apologetics why every christian should do apologetics and i'll expand on that next week too so let's begin with what apologetics is not okay number one let me state the obvious right apologetics is not uh, apologizing for your christian faith oh 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 you're a christian yeah yes i'm sorry i'm sorry I, I didn't mean to didn't mean to offend you for being christian i'm sorry that is not apologetics okay uh but it kind of sounds you know uh, i guess a little weird putting it that way like okay that's very obvious but there are some christians who do, in a sense, apologize for their Christianity in that sort of way. Here's what I mean. When, when given, in a sense, or, or when, when, uh, uh, when presented with, with uh, I guess, what we'll call the theological sneer, right? You don't really believe that stuff, do you? There are Christians out there who will go, well, maybe it doesn't really say that. You know, we can, um, and what they do is they sort of tone down what the Bible says or deny what the Bible says so that they can present a Jesus that's more appealing to the person who's asking. Okay? So in one sense, that's sort of a way of them trying to win over or defend Christianity by redefining Christianity because, in a sense, they're, they really are apologizing that the gospel is so offensive and they try to take away the offense of the gospel. Okay, uh, for instance, another one, okay, the Bible teaches that God decrees all things that come to pass, Ephesians 1.11, okay, but, and here's the, one of the big problems, no matter what, what, uh, uh, what view you take of God's sovereignty or God's providence, the problem of evil, okay, here's the big one for every single Christian, every single person who believes in religion has to somehow deal with the problem of evil, okay, so, uh, when pressed about the problem of evil, it's not uncommon for some Christians to redefine God in such a way that he does not have his hand in anything at all. So, for instance, there's a movement called open theism. Okay? Open theism is a view about God that God is open about the future. Okay? And then stated in the clearest possible terms, and they'll tell you, God does not know the future. The only thing God perfectly knows is the past he's learning the present and the future is completely open and so what this kind of theology has done is basically redefined god so that we can have a view of evil and an answer to the problem of evil that is satisfactory somewhat to us does that really satisfy the problem of evil no it starts to raise more questions it starts like well so you're telling me that we have a god you know, who, while he's apparently very compassionate and comes alongside of us so much, you know, but he's 
really can't do anything for us then because we're the ones teaching him about the present and he has no idea, he can't guarantee the future to anybody. And in a sense, that kind of has been, you know, you know that approach in theology, and it's more modern within the last like 30 to 40 years, has kind of capitulated to basically the arguments presented by atheistic philosophers. They can't believe and they refuse to believe in a God who would decree even the death of his own son on a cross because of how offensive that that sounds. And so, the, you know, you can see there's, these, there's, this, uh, there's this capitulating to them. Like, well, how can we make them happy so that Jesus, you know, is more appealing? And no matter what you do, I mean, if you cave, they're still not going to convert. You know, you, you, can, you can make God a sweet teddy bear for them, and they still won't convert. <laughs> you know? So uh, that happens, okay? So the Christian faith is not defended when it is accommodated so as not to be offensive to unbelievers. As Christians, we should settle within ourselves. And we should know, because we were unbelievers, right, the gospel is offensive. When it really comes down to it, it you know, in, in, in our state of unbelief, and we'll, we'll detail this later when we get into, uh, into defending against who, in our state of unbelief, we proclaim to be God in our hearts. We claim to be the ones who are going to be the masters of our ship. And so when God comes around, a God who says, I created the world, I created you, you owe me, that's offensive. When God calls us sinners, that's offensive to sinners. And we've talked about this in other studies. Our inner lawyer comes out, right? We're all our best lawyer. I'm not a sinner, God. If you would have been in my shoes, you know, well, you don't know the temptation I went through. And we start reasoning away our own sin. We start explaining our sinfulness as if we're going to get off the hook. Our natural state, the natural state of unbelief, is autonomy, that we are a self-law. We define our own morals. We define what makes us good. I mean, we all do it, right? We all have our little standards in our own brain. We're like, if I just do this, I'm a good person. As long as I'm doing this and not that, I'm a good person. We do that. We do that. I mean, the, the gospel in this way, the gospel is offensive. The God of the Bible is offensive. That's why the surrounding nations would always make up their own gods that were just like them. But that isn't like following also the law of the land in terms of being an abiding citizen. Like would that person also ascribe to that? Yeah, in, in, in some sense a person can appeal to what we would call their civil righteousness. Right. And oh well I'm a law abiding citizen therefore God loves me and accepts me because I'm a law abiding citizen. <laughs> You know, so yeah, so you know, different cultures, different people, they all have their their own. Um, they all have, in a sense, their own standards. I mean, even even within gangs, right? Yeah. Even within gangs, there are certain their gangs have certain codes that they will not break, and as long as they adhere to that code, they can be violent blood gangs. But as long as they adhere to their own code, in their own minds, they're a good person. They're, they're just doing what any good gang's supposed to do, right? You know, so, I mean, there's our attempt at self-righteousness all the time. We all have it. And the God of the Bible, when he comes to anybody, to us, that's offensive. And is it like the terrorists, they think in the name of Allah, they're doing good. Yeah. They're killing Christians or whoever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're, they have to earn their righteousness by doing in a sense, what God tells them. And so, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a religious form of self-righteousness is what that boils down to. Yeah, so um, uh, the Bible says that the gospel itself is an offense to Jew and to Greek. Okay, you look at the cross, right? What does the cross tell you? The cross tells you, one, you deserve to die. No matter how good you are, you deserve to die. If Jesus had to die on the cross, you could never have been good enough, and so Jesus had to come. And then, you know, it's offensive, it, uh, it's got offenses the other way, right? You know, you're so bad, Jesus had to die. So think about it, the gospel cuts both ways. You're not good enough, Jesus had to die. You know, you're so bad that Jesus had to die. <laughs> it cuts both ways. It, it offends the religious and the irreligious. Hence, we should not apologize for the offensiveness of the gospel against the self-righteousness of men. We should not apologize 
for the offense of a transcendent and self-sufficient God. We'll talk about those terms later. I'm just going to use them now, okay? We should not apologize for the offense of the cross. We should not apologize, basically, for a God who really is God and who does judge sinners. We should not apologize for a God who makes absolute moral claims over his creatures. We should never back down from that. When we do, we are no longer defending Christianity. We are no longer doing Christian apologetics. Now you're defending the God of the philosophers. Okay? And Christ said right about, um, if you deny me before man, right? That's such a hard passage to yeah. contend with. Yeah, it, it, you know, there, there are certain situations um, definitely where that becomes... Um, you know, very real when we're given opportunity. Uh, and, you know, there's other places that, um, where Jesus talks about how when we will be brought before men, you know, and, and that it's the Spirit himself who will speak through us, you know, especially in those moments, you know, we cannot, uh, we shouldn't waste them. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't say, well, I guess my life is, uh, is worth, uh, worth more than heaven, so let me keep it for now. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't give in. You know, we really... Um, you really have to know your faith. You really have to be in love with Jesus <laughs> to speak up, you know, in a sense to speak up for him, you know, and to speak with him. Because if the Spirit's speaking through us, we're speaking, in, in a sense, it's the Spirit speaking through us and with us, you know, so we don't want to capitulate there. So apologetics is not apologizing for the offense of the Christian faith. Okay. Uh, added to this sort of capitulation uh, are answers that do not answer the questions that are asked about the Christian faith. Okay. For instance, uh, instead of offering a clear statement of belief, okay, a Christian might respond back with something to the effect of, "Well, you know, nobody really knows uh, uh, about this. You know, like uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say uh, the justice of God in hell." You know, uh, there's a big one, too. You know, there's another one, right? <laughs> Get into that one later. But, you know, okay, the justice of God in hell. You know, and supposing somebody asks you, you know, well, what is hell really like? Uh, well, um, you know, I'm not really sure if, it's, if, if they actually go through eternal punishment or if they kind of cease to exist after a certain point or, or if it's just a metaphor, you know, and it's like, Kind of not being clear is also another way that we capitulate or that we kind of apologize and kind of like, well, let me, let me shy myself away from this. You know, like I don't, I don't want to answer the question. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to offend them or, or, or push them away. Instead of just being clear, like, well, this is what the Bible says. This is why it says it. You know, we all have an issue with justice. We all want justice when we've been wronged. You know, so in a sense, when God, the eternal infinite person, has been wronged, doesn't it make sense that God would right the wrong, that he would exact justice? You know, and you start, you, you put it another way, like, well, what if you were the offended party? <laughs> okay, justice makes a little bit more sense. We just don't like it because we're the guilty party, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, this is where you extend the gospel out in there, too. So, um so you don't want to offer, in a sense, just options for them to pick. You know, well, was Jesus God and man? Well, the options are that he was, uh, he was uh, fully God, but he only uh, looked like a man, or he was fully God and part of him became a man. Or, you know, you don't want to give them options. You want to tell them, this is Christianity. Jesus is both God and man. I don't know, I can't explain the hypostatic union, or, you know, big fancy theological word. But both are true. Jesus is both God and man. I'm not going to apologize it. I don't have to explain it to you. This is what we're required to believe. This is what the Bible teaches. Okay, so hence we should not seek to make our faith more acceptable in order uh, for it to be believed by reducing its offense or its teaching uh, to what some, come, uh, some have called a mere Christianity. Okay, and you know, uh, obvious reference to C.S. Lewis's book. Um, we don't want to just present a common denominator Christianity sometimes, in a sense where you just kind of strip too much away that you lose it. You know, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to present the core, the meat, you know, of what Christianity is, of the gospel. And there are certain components that if you remove, I mean, if you take away a God, 
you know, uh, if you take away, in a sense, certain attributes of God away from the gospel, the gospel is no longer guaranteed. Oh, God will save, you know, God will save you forever and ever. Well, if you have a God, you know, the God of open theism, who doesn't know the future, how can God promise that? Can't. The gospel gets radically redefined if we change certain components that make the gospel what it is. Okay? So, uh, another thing that apologetics is not, apologetics is not arguing people into the faith. Okay? It is not arguing people into the faith. All right? Uh, so, some people think that apologetics or learning how to do apologetics is about uh, emotional argumentation or that, is, or that it is simply about outwitting your opponent. Okay? Uh, probably one of the worst things that can happen in apologetics is for the Christian to have the goal in mind of simply winning the argument. Okay? That is, that is the worst thing that you can have. Okay? Basically, you look at your opponent and they're nothing but a notch under your belt. Okay? Or you're just out there basically for your own glory to show everybody how smart you are and, and, and how, uh, how witty you are and how you can uh, articulate the faith and do all that kind of stuff like that. That is not apologetics. That is showboating. Okay? Our, our goal is not about winning. It's about witness. Okay? Our goal is not necessarily winning. It is about witness. And so here I'll take the example of Christ. Okay? Christ, when he lived his life, by all, by all appearances, he lost, right? He lost to the Jews. He lost to the Romans. He went to the cross. And he died. But what did he do? He witnessed that his father was more important than the glory of getting an earthly kingdom right then and there. Right? He witnessed against Satan and the temptation. He witnessed to the Jews and even to the Romans that glorifying God was more important. And sometimes that might be, or that might mean losing. Okay? It's okay, you know, when, once, hopefully once you guys get the hang of this, or even if you guys already, in a sense, do get into these discussions, it's okay to walk away and not having shattered your opponent. That's okay. Okay? That's, so, that's perfectly fine. That actually might be a little bit better, okay? You don't want to do that. You might harden them in their unbelief, okay? It's okay to have an apparent loss as long as you witnessed to God witnessed to Jesus Christ. From there, what they do with that witness, that's part of their, their business between them and God. Okay? Uh, one of the things that we need to see about fallen human nature, okay, also is that, uh, that the nature of those whom we're doing apologetics against, and it's our nature outside of Christ, is that it takes more than a valid and sound argument for a person to believe the gospel. We are so dead in trespasses and sins that God himself has to bring us to life. What does Ephesians 2, you know, 1 through 3 say? And you who are dead in trespasses and sins, God made alive. Okay? So we cannot do that. We cannot make them alive. If, we, if it was logic and reasoning and stuff like that that could bring a dead sinner to life, okay, you know, the church has some very good logicians and some very good you know, systematic theologians and stuff in his history, boy, the, more of the world should be Christian. But it, it takes more than that. It takes more than an argument to bring a dead heart to life. God has to impart life. What did Jesus say? You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Okay? Winning a debate, winning an argument is not how you bring regeneration to somebody, okay? So that, that needs to be clear, okay? Think about the times that, uh, also too in the Bible, when people witness miracles, right? I mean, if you, were, if you were there when Moses, you know, parted the Red Sea, if you were there when Jesus brought Lazarus to life, you know, we, it's all easy for us to say, right? Oh, man, I would have believed right then and there. But we have the same hearts as all the crowd, and what they still doubted. They still didn't believe. 
You know, they, they walked through a parted Red Sea. What more do you want, right? That God is with us. You've got a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day leading you, taking you everywhere. <laughs> and you get to this one mountain, and Moses is gone for a couple of days. And it's like, hey, uh, tired of this place. Let's make our own gods. Aaron, you're going to help us out? And what is Aaron, right? Yeah, hey, bring me your earrings. Let's, let's go. Let's do this, you know. And it's like, oh, man, how easy it is to fall away, how easy it is, you know, uh, uh, to fall into unbelief. And I mean, even that tells you, even witnessing a miracle is not enough to change a stony heart. It really does take an act of God on their heart. So we need to keep that in mind. You don't want to beat the bloody, you know, you don't want to beat them into a bloody pulp, into, you know, using your intellectual prowess or whatever, or you're just, you know, yelling and screaming or anything like that, or your emotions that's not going to change them, okay? Um, hence, so this course, you know, it's not going to teach you any pithy sayings or witty remarks that you can use to win arguments, okay? That's not going to be the goal of this. I'm not going to give you a standard remark. Well, when somebody says this, well, just always use this, you know, so you're not going to get that, okay, at all from this, okay? So it needs to be settled right now uh, that uh, nobody here will ever convert anybody to Christianity, okay? Only the Holy Spirit will. Only the Holy Spirit will do that, okay? Um, we need to think, uh, you know, our job is to glorify God, and I'll say more about this in a, in, a, in a moment, but our job is to glorify God by being the instruments that he uses to reach unbelievers, okay? To give witness, okay? Uh, we are not the sharp end of the stick, okay? We're the crooked stick that God can still draw a straight line with, okay? <laughs> Let's all just settle that right now. We're all crooked sticks, but God in, in his infinite wisdom can still draw a straight line with a crooked stick, okay? God, the way the Bible puts it, is that God uses the foolish things of this world, right? So even something as, 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 uh, as speaking, as preaching, you know, uh, uh, you know, these things, little conversations, God uses those things to confound the wise of the world and to draw people to himself, okay? Think about revival in Nineveh, right? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. If you've heard revival sermons, you know that that's not the greatest revival sermon in the history of revivals, right? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed and bam, a, a city converts for a while, you know? They experience a sort, of, a sort of revival and God withdraws his wrath from them. You know, it didn't take much, but God used that. Just those little words. That was it, you know. So the Holy Spirit can use the foolish things of this world to confound and to convert those who are wise in their own eyes, and he can convert them to true wisdom. So, now that we know what apologetics is not, what is apologetics, okay? Well, apologetics is a reasoned defense of the Christian faith, okay? Okay? Apologetics is a reasoned defense of the Christian faith. Okay? If you look on 1 Peter 3.15, in 1 Peter 3.15, it says this. It says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Okay, the words that are translated as to make a defense is the Greek word pros apologia. Okay, pros apologia, which basically means toward a defense. Okay, toward a defense. All right, uh, it was used, uh, this is the word apologia. Okay, it was used uh, back in those times. It was basically what a defense lawyer did, okay? They made an apology. You think of like uh, uh, Plato, uh, when he's talking about Socrates, Socrates made an apology before his accusers, okay? In the early church, there was uh, an early father, uh, Justin Martyr, about 150, that's when he lived. He wrote a book called The Apology that he wrote basically to hopefully one day hand it to the emperor to make a reasoned case for why Christians are good for the empire, and they're not as wicked and evil as their accusers make them to seem, okay? It's a legal word, okay? It's a legal word. It's basically what a defense lawyer did, okay? Um, 
we can define, okay, so we already defined apologetics. Uh, there's a couple of ways, okay? Uh, we already said a reasoned defense of the Christian faith. The other way, it's the application of biblical truth to unbelief, okay? The application of biblical truth to unbelief. And the third way that I like to define uh, apologetics, premeditated evangelism. Premeditated evangelism. Defined that way as premeditated evangelism, and even with, the, with these other ways, uh, apologetics doesn't sound that bad. It doesn't sound that hard. It doesn't sound that scary, so don't let like the big, you know, thick Josh McDowell books fool you, you know, that you have to know all that to do apologetics. No, it helps to know this, okay? And again, if you don't like big, fat books, get a thin line Bible, okay? That helps a lot, all right? Uh, okay, however, things get tricky, okay, guys? I mean, I won't, I won't lie. I mean, you know, things can get a little bit tricky, but they don't have to. Uh, when you realize that unbelief comes in many different forms, okay? So when we talk about apologetics as an application of biblical truth to unbelief, unbelief comes in a lot of different forms, Okay? It comes. Uh, it can come in forms like uh, uh, irreligious forms, like immoral lifestyles. Okay, how would you apply biblical truth to the unbelief of Fifty Shades of Grey? Mm -hmm. uh, there's one to think about because that's that's happening, right? The movie's coming out sometime soon, right? How do we apply biblical truth to the unbelief that comes through in Fifty Shades of Grey? Or in other, you know, in other books and other things that uh, that have our attention, how do we apply biblical truth to, let's say, rebellious living? You know, there's another one. There was a time um, in the past, culturally speaking, where people were more open to kind of logical, factual conversations about. Um, let's just look at where you're at, and I'm concerned about. Um, where this road is going to end up if you continue, mm -hmm. just in terms of like a discussion of consequences. Do you yeah. think that we've become, um, for the bottom of the question, because I hear you <coughs> breathing for a response, um, do you think we've become so mushy as a culture where everything is about feelings and we don't want to hurt people's feelings, and so we don't even have those conversations, even amongst believers? Well, part of it, so there was a time when it was like that, when culture, in a, in a sense, when we were more community-oriented. What started to change that was what we would call modernism. Modernism started introducing a radical individualism, and we even see it in Christianity. Christianity used to be about community. You know, when you belong to a church, basically the entire church was your family. But at some point, you know, uh, with the introduction of modernism and the individualism that came out of it, all of a sudden, and I mean, we hear it in evangelicalism, right? We hear it, my relationship with God is my own. And it used to be, your relationship with God is our relationship with you. It used to be that way. And so, you know, and the one good thing about the individualism is that it has reminded us that we are supposed to have personal, but it shouldn't just remain individual. We're part of a body. We're part of a community. So as... Uh, as culture and as society has changed to become more individualistic, uh, we have kind of done the whole, uh, in a sense, we've capitulated to the worldview that basically says everybody has the right to define their own happiness, to define their own meaning, and to define their own purpose. So it might involve feelings, or it might also be the, hey, hands off, that's their life, I can't touch it. You know, it could have a combination of those things in there. But also, too, I mean, uh, as far as having conversations, um, it used to be that people read more and people just conversed more because there was nothing else to do. But as we've become more entertainment-driven and we've become, yeah, we've become more amused, you know, we, we, we seek things for amusement to be without thought, um, we can't sustain that. And, I mean, even, uh, even in Christian churches, sermons are, they're, you're told, right? You know, at least I, this is what I hear, right? Keep it short. Their, their attention span is only this much. So you have, to, you have to work. You've got about 20 minutes, let's say, to, to get in everything. You know, and it's like, well, 
you know, we can see ourselves and just, you know, giving into, well, there's no attention span. You know, giving into those, letting other people, uh, letting other people probe us. So that has definitely affected us, you know, uh, in a sense larger, but it's crept into the church as well. You know, I mean, even in the church, I mean, like part of the idea behind church membership too, uh, when you became a member of a church, you gave the right, in a sense, to the pastor and to the elder to have permission to, when you're messing up in your life, that they can say, this needs to be corrected. But now that you have, you know, in a sense, you have people going to churches um, that, uh, that either don't require membership or they just don't want to become a member, that's their way of saying, in a sense, I'll be here as long as you don't get all up in my business. And I don't give you the right to do that. I don't give you that, uh, that headship over me. And I'm free to go to a different church. And I mean, this happens too, right? When we don't like the, they're getting a little too nosy in my life in this church, just go over to another one. Boom, start, uh, start, start all over again. You know, and there's no, there's no accountability there. So there's a lot larger frameworks that, that are in place that have led to that. You know, so. Well, the opposite is true. Then nobody knows. Nobody cares. Or nobody's nosy. Yeah, you know, uh, that's another thing too, right? I mean, everybody's just so busy. It's just like I ain't got time for that, right? I mean, isn't that the meme? Isn't you know who got time for that? You know, um, it's true. You know, I mean, sometimes we, sometimes we, um, I guess let's just say, it, sometimes we just don't care. Sometimes we just don't care enough to to steer somebody. Defined apologetics, right? What it is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about it as a fence, correct? And I can't help but um, think of the word confrontation is just coming to mind. And sometimes we think of confrontation as a negative thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't really know how to oftentimes use confrontation for good. Yeah. But my thoughts are. Um, maybe at the end of what you're speaking about as it relates to apologetics, <coughs> just how we can um, confront mm -hmm. one another in love. Um, um, so can I give an example? Sure. Okay. So um, my sister Jasmine, she, she goes to Princeton Theological Seminary, which obviously um, their theology is very liberal. And so I didn't is, used to be. <laughs> yes. And so she's um, taking some courses where, where now she's at the point where she has to practice um, her preaching stuff that she's learned. And so she's applying for internships at different Christian churches. And so she's finding that um, the churches that would allow her to practice preaching and teaching which I'm not so certain that that's the direction that she wants to go in, but that's her assignment for right now. Mm -hmm. um, so the churches who would allow her to engage in that capacity as a woman are also um, very liberal on their theology concerning um, lifestyle preference. Mm -hmm. And so I've been really praying for my sister um, because we grew up with a certain understanding of scripture and, and, and a belief in what God's will is in terms of preference. And so I know that she's being really challenged because I think she's probably one of the only ones in her circle that ascribes to a conservative view of, I don't know if that's what it would even be called, a conservative view of, yeah. in terms of role between relationship. And so... I'm praying for her because obviously I don't want her to be impacted by that worldview. And I mean, a lot of really great, wonderful, well-meaning churches who also endorse a certain lifestyle. And I'm not talking about the people who are just coming to church, but I'm talking about people who are in church leadership, which I think that's totally different. So I'm trying to land the plane now. So um, <laughs> when we have people... Um, I just think, where do we, how do we, do we, in terms of people coming into the congregation just to visit, who are in open, um, as an example, I'm just using this, um, homosexual relationships.
and when and where and how does that get, I don't know if confronted is the appropriate word, or? Well, um. And I'm only asking that question in terms of apologetics being a premeditated, you know, defense. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm feeling is like we really need to know where we stand as believers. And if we're going to live authentically with one another, then where do, where's the place for that kind of conversation? How does that, you know? Um, and if I'm totally off track, we can keep going. Well, no, cause, well, I mean, here, let me, let me just leave it at this point, and, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to emphasize this in, in, uh, in lesson three, but one, we do need to, and, and I will say the word, we do need to fight for the faith. In Jude 3, Jude, Jude tells his audience, contend for the faith, and the, the word for contend there, it's basically fight with skill, but I mean, he is telling his people, fight. Fight for the faith. You you need to. You know, Paul even Paul even uh, describes the Christian life, in a sense, as a battle or as a fight. He says, "Fight the good fight." You know, so we should do it. We have to pick our battles wisely. This is one thing that I'll say. You know, you do have to pick uh, pick the battles wisely. In uh, in Second Timothy two, uh, twenty three through twenty five, this is one thing. You know, it kind of like with the argument, and you want to make sure that you don't pick up a spirit of just arguing, right. you know, like that too. So, you know, she needs a lot of wisdom in where to pick it. You know, like, I mean, if she's a seminary student, possibly in the topics for her papers that she does are one possible yeah, way to do I that. Yeah, and she's definitely used that as a venue is, is in her writing yeah. and in her conversation with her, profession, her, her professors. If I had a concern, it would be more on the other side, and I have and a concern also just for myself or for believers where the pendulum is on the other side where we're avoiding and we don't want to touch the topic and you know you know we're gonna you know love one another and love and love and love and love and let's say I'm in a relationship right and I'm still coming to church you know and you know let's say Leora is my sister in Christ and she sees this going on but I'm coming to church like I'm cute and like quoting scripture and everything's dandy and maybe what's stirring up in her spirit is like Because we're, we don't want to hurt people, right? She yeah. doesn't want to offend me or, you know. Uh, um, I mean, the, 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 guide, the guidelines, I mean, as far as for approaching those are in Matthew 18. You know, you go personally first. You take it personally. And these are, these are actually the steps for church discipline, too. You go personally first. Your brother, you know, your sister sins against you. You confront privately. You talk about that, you know. If, if they don't, then next time you take a witness, preferably somebody not biased, right, and that doesn't really have anything involved in there. But, uh, you know, you want a Christian brother or sister who can be neutral, who can at least hear your case, hear the other side, and, okay, you've got a witness in there, right? If that doesn't work, if they're still, you know, open, blatant, sin, you know, and you have to pick your battles, right? Like, I, I saw you chewing tobacco, you know, and like, uh, you know, you got to watch some of the... Some of the battles that you try to pick in different faith traditions take different approaches on there too. I, I always, you know, poke fun here, at least in the Revelation studies. You know, like, oh look, there's going to be wine on the table at the, uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. For those of you that don't enjoy a good glass of wine now, no, I'm kidding. But you know, different faith traditions have different approaches, you know, to that. You know, um, you know, what are we going to pick our battles over? You know, you need wisdom there. You know. Not only that, I think the person that you're wanting to confront, if you will, or to speak truth into, that they may not want it. Yeah. You know, you can be the most yeah. gracious, the most loving, the most gifted yeah. person that's speaking and communicating, now, but if somebody's not wanting to receive the truth. Now, here, here's something that needs to happen first, and I think this is from Galatians 6. Before you confront, you need to confront your own heart first. Before you confront, you confront your own heart first. Because a lot of times there's like, you know, there's the Christian police, right? And what is it? It's nothing but an elder brother. Nothing but, a, you know, in a sense, I mean, some people who feel better about themselves when they confront other people about their sins. In other words, that helps some people get their self-righteousness by pointing out other people's flaws. 
but not pointing out their own. You know, a church discipline, it's not something that's a lot of times very popular, even talked about, or even taught a lot of times in, in, in a lot of, uh, I guess, for, for professional ministers and seminaries and stuff. But the point of it, and Jesus says it, right? I mean, you know, in a sense, when you confront them, you're trying to win them back. All, that's the goal, you know? And so when it says treat them like a tax collector, that doesn't mean just kick him out and let him burn. It means re-evangelize him. Bring them back into the fold. That's the goal of church discipline. That's the goal of apologetics. That's the goal of evangelism. So you can kind of see how a lot of these things just end up blending in together. So you, treat him as a tax collector means to... Well, yeah, you, I, what do you want? What's the Great Commission? Evangelize them. Yeah, so in a sense, basically, you don't confront them as a Christian. You confront them as an unbeliever. But what are you confronting them with? With the gospel still. Which is love. Right. Yeah, it's, it's still the gospel. So, you know, this is, it, it's one thing, you know, you have, before you confront, check your own heart first. Yeah, and I was going to say, is it two? I mean, there's no, two, one sin, no better or worse than any other sin. It's like we need to search our own heart. I mean, you know, we all have sin. And it's like asking God to search my heart and see if there's some troubling way. I think only as the Spirit of God leads and, and he, you know, I mean, the other day I, I was praying for somebody and the Lord, it's like the Holy Spirit showed me something that, and I think this was from God, he showed me something that concerned, you know, and and uh, I, I was able to talk to that person and they said, yeah, you know, but it was the Holy Spirit that revealed that to me. And it wasn't, you know, I was like trying to find something. It was just something that God showed me. And uh, the Second Timothy passage I was talking about. Uh, Second Timothy, and this goes with part of checking our hearts and, and our motives for when we confront. But in Second Timothy two, twenty three, uh, all the way through twenty six, actually it says it says have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. And boy, do you need that in apologetics, because apologetics, it, essentially, it should be a long, ongoing conversation, okay? You should be willing to do that. This has also been part of the problem with old evangelism techniques. It's, let's go in there and offer them the gospel one time, and if they didn't take it on that first try, well, they're going to hell. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, it sometimes work. It involves relationship, okay, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents. Okay, so this might mean, you know, well, you know what, we're going to get together for coffee, and we're going to talk about this one problem, and let me help you think better about Christianity. Now, that may not, not solve everything, it might not solve all your questions, but let me at least help you think correctly. And then we can correct a little bit more as we go. Okay? With gentleness. Okay? Correcting his opponents with gentleness. <laughs> all right? Not beating them over the head with your Bible. Okay? Then look. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So notice, too, I mean, in a sense, you know, whether this is, uh, in a sense, a brother, an unbeliever, notice the position of the other person, too. And this is where our compassion should come in and doing apologetics, is that they have been captured by the devil to what do his will. Second Timothy 2, 23 <coughs> through 26. Okay, so keep that in mind. I mean, you don't do this just to quarrel and just to fight. There's a reason why we do it. And so in, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but in a sense, when we say defense, you know, the only offense that we should have is the offense of the gospel itself. We shouldn't be pugnacious. In a sense, the person who gives the offense should be Christ and him on the cross, not us. Okay? Not our tone and not our attitude, how we come across. Okay? So, uh, that's what apologetics is, premeditated evangelism, the application of biblical truth to unbelief, giving a reasoned defense of the Christian faith. So now finally, let me, let me finish up with these. Why do apologetics? Okay, uh, why are we engaging apologetics? Okay, 
uh, number one. Okay, uh, I'm going to expand this reason next week. But apart from the reason that it's commanded, okay, First Timothy three, or First Peter three fifteen. I'm sorry, commands us, commanded every Christian, not just the pastor, not just the professor, not just the well trained expert, but every single Christian is commanded to do apologetics. Okay. Um, Many would say, and this is a real argument, right? Many would contend that God does not need anybody to defend him. Maybe you all have seen the meme or seen it on Facebook or just heard it, right? God doesn't need defending. You know, the Bible doesn't need defending. It's like a lion. Just let it loose and God defends himself. You know, uh, Charles Spurgeon actually <laughs> said that, okay? Um, that sounds great and it sounds very, very spiritual, but it's actually rejecting responsibility and the privilege of working with God. Okay? So it's, it's rejecting uh, the responsibility and the privilege of working with God. So our first reason for doing apologetics is that it's commanded. Okay? It's commanded. All right? Uh, the Bible is not going to open itself to the people who have questions. It's not going to open itself to objectors. Okay? Uh, the Bible is not going to flip its own pages. It's not going to magically start speaking. Rather... The God of the universe who needs nothing and is not served by the hands of men, he calls us alongside of himself to work with him. God gives us the opportunity to be his mouthpieces. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 21, listen to this says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about our outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That was not written to the pastors. It was written to an entire church, an entire misbehaving church at that, right? The Corinthians. God making his appeal through us. Right? Hear that again. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A couple of points that come out of here. Okay, uh, One, because we know who God is, right? The fear of the Lord, the way it's said in here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. Okay? Because we know who God is, we persuade others. Now, classical Greek rhetoric, right? Okay, uh, list logos, okay, or logos. That is what you say. Pathos, how you say it, okay, and ethos, the life of the one saying it, as part of the tools of persuasion. Okay, ethos uh, is uh, the life of the one saying it, in a sense, the person saying it. First one is logos, okay, logos, basically the word, what you say, okay, uh, pathos, how you say it. So, I mean, if you, you know, like maybe you tell them, ah, I'm going to hell, you know, boom. My logos is correct, right? I'm using the right words in a sense. My pathos is horrible. 
You know, my pathos is horrible to talk, in a sense, to talk about eternal torment so flippantly at somebody. You're not going to win them that way. You're just going to push them away. Okay? Uh, and then ethos, the life of the one saying it. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, you'll, this happens to us a lot, right? We'll hear something from somebody, and we don't believe them. But we hear it from somebody else, exact same words, and we believe them. Yes. Everybody know that experience, right? Yes. You know what the difference is? The difference is usually the ethos. Sometimes it's the life of the person saying it. So what do, what do we capitulate to? The expert, right? Well, when an expert says it, but when Moses says it, you know, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or when a book says it, you know, we believe it, but we could have had a friend who gave us the exact same advice <laughs> and we didn't take it. Why? Persuasion, the way that that works. Okay? Here's another thing. Okay, another thing that comes out of that passage. So that one first, the, uh, pointing out just that we persuade others. Okay? Uh, two, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? God gives us the ministry of reconciliation. God asks us to participate in his own work of reconciliation. God asks us to be reconciled not only to him, but to each other as well. And to bring others into the reconciliation that God offers the world. Okay? And so that is what apologetics is all about. Okay, it's about basically removing all the excuses that a person has that keeps them from Christ. They offer you one reason, I can't believe in a God who? Yes, you can. You do it every day. I can't believe in a God who, who, who would send people to hell. You believe in judges who send people to prison. You believe in, in, in justice in the world. Yes, you can. You can believe in that kind of God. You know, when you start removing the excuses that they have, Okay, that's, that's part of what apologetics is. That's why it's premeditated evangelism. Okay, so in short, okay, uh, it is our privilege to be called alongside God, the sovereign and holy God of the universe, to be a part of his work. God called and he commissioned Isaiah to go for him, right? He didn't need Isaiah. You know, God just throws out the question, who will go for us? Here am I, send me. God didn't need Isaiah. He could have put, thanks, Isaiah, thanks for being here for, you know, for, uh, for the light show here in the temple and everything that you saw. Um, I'm going to go find somebody out there. But God used Isaiah. He used him. God gives us all the privilege of the prophetic work of proclaiming the truth of God. This is part of, in a sense, uh, uh, the promise in, uh, in Joel, your, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. It doesn't necessarily mean a, a foretelling of the future but a fourth telling of the word of God. All of God's people, male and female, sons and daughters, have the privilege of sharing the word of God. It may not all be in, the, in, a, in a sense in a, the capacity of ordained ministry, but the, the Bible gives every single one of us, not just ordained clergy, that responsibility, that privilege. Okay? This is going to bring us to our third and final reason. So the first reason for apologetics, one, God commands it. And these, you can put these as the same reasons for evangelism. Why do evangelism? Because God commands it. Why do apologetics? Because God commands it. Okay? Two, because God privileges us to, be, to work with Him. Okay? And three, to bring glory to God. Okay? To bring glory to God. It is not a small thing. Okay? It is not a small thing to proclaim the truth of God. Boy, does that take courage in this world. And it glorifies God when His truth is preached, when His truth is proclaimed, when His truth is spoken of. That glorifies God. Does that mean winning the argument? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Sometimes it might, it might be like Polycarp, right? Polycarp, will you renounce Jesus? I've served Jesus 86 years. Why would I deny Him now? Bring the wood, light the fire. I'm not denying Jesus. That brings glory to God more than if Polycarp had reasoned, well, let me give you 50 reasons for believing in God or for believing in Jesus. Just the fact that he would stand up for Christ brought glory to God. And so that's part of what apologetics is about, too, is ultimately bringing glory to God, whether they convert then or later or they don't convert. It's still to the glory 
of God. God is glorified when his truth is faithfully proclaimed. So with that, uh, 